Sam has been working in a number of fields that I think are relevant for, for this venue, uh, including effect handlers or drive effect handlers. Uh, but also, as maybe as the as one of the proponents of, uh, of pacifism, as we <laughs> seen earlier. And um, yeah, Jamie was just going to talk about uh, generic programming with uh, effect handlers. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I, I'm afraid my, my uh, laptop isn't, uh, well, it's just about talking to the projector, but, but not, not as it should. So some of the slides are slightly cut off, but most of my talk will, with any luck, be code anyway in Emacs, which seems to be displaying a little bit better. Um, okay. So yeah, I was, I was invited to give a talk, uh, and I thought I'd quite like to um, say something about, about the stuff I've done with effect handlers, well, and other people have. Uh, and it's more or less going to be a sort of introduction. Uh, but I had a student who has recently been adding um, an extension to this research language I've been working on with Phil Wadler for the last 10 years or so, called Lynx. Um, he added effect handlers to the existing language, so I thought I'd try and um, implement some examples and demonstrate them in his, his extension. Uh, which maybe wasn't such a wise thing to do, given that he's only just finished it and there were various bugs and things, but, but hopefully it will work out okay. Um, and... I kind of decided, I originally, the original title I had was Programming with Effect Handlers, but this is a generic programming workshop, so I thought I'd stick generic in the front as well. <laughs> but to be fair, I, I mean, this, this is a, this does facilitate the form of generic programming. So. Um, yeah, so, well, it's not cutting too much off. Um, okay, so. The, the, the motiva motivation for, for this effect handler work is we, we want to be able to write modular programs using effects. Um, so our starting point is, is this notion of, of abstract computations over some sort of signature of operations. Um, so you can kind of think of, of sort of monadic style programming in Haskell perhaps. And, and operations are things like get and put, or raising an exception, or that kind of thing. Uh, except initially they're, they're just abstract. Um, but having, having written, written a, an abstract computation, we can then interpret it in various different ways. Um, and it would be nice if, if we could do this modularly. So we, we define our interpreters in terms of interpretations of the underlying operations. And we might have various different interpreters. We might want to interpret some of our operations in, in different ways, instrument them, or, um, or just, just have, have different ways of interpreting them. Uh, and furthermore, we, we, it's useful to be able to compose these interpreters. So if I have an interpreter for state or something, I can combine it with all kinds of other effects. I don't have to write one big monolithic thing. So and th this is what an, an effect handler is, essentially an interpreter for abstract computations. Uh, and yeah, in its simplest form, we have closed effect handlers that just, you have a fixed set of operations, you say how, how they're interpreted. Uh, but in order to be composable, um, we also want open effect handlers, which where, where we specify, say, say we had an open state handler, we specify how to handle the get and put operations, uh, and any other operations just kind of get forwarded through to the output. So it generates another abstract computation, and then you can combine that with other handlers. Um, so you might be thinking, well, okay, there are lots of systems that do this kind of thing. I mean, monads, mon monad transformers, and lots of Haskell libraries that, that facilitate this kind of thing, uh, and I'm not going to disagree with that. This is just kind of starting from the ground up and, and saying what the simplest thing is that we want. And then uh, you, you can implement it 
um, on top of existing abstractions, or, or, or maybe you can start from a, a fresh. So, there are some trees. So, yeah, we can view these. The, the intuition for what these abstract computations is, is, is that they're trees over the, the, the signature of operations um, that eventually return some, some final return value. Uh, and the nodes of these trees are, are labeled with, with the operations and the parameters to the operations, and the edges indicate the, the result values from, from the, the, the operations. And then the leaves give you the final, final result. Um, and, and algebraic effects, um, which were introduced by Plotkin and Power, um, essentially the same thing, except you actually quotient these trees by, by some equations, so you give some meaning to these operations. Uh, but in, in this setting, we're not going to worry about um, the equations. So an example, a very simple example, uh, an effect signature that, where, where I have a get operation, a put operation, uh, over a Boolean state, um, and I might write this, this toggle computation that just gets the value of the state and then negates it and then returns the original value. And this corresponds to, to this, this uh, tree here. Uh, so you see that the, 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 uh, yeah, the return value appears on all the way Yeah, true or, f or false appearing at the leaves. Um, or I should say, yeah, please interrupt and, and ask questions if you have any. Um, another example, we might have a choice operation and a fail operation. Um, and yeah, imagine I'm, I'm a drunk and I, I want to toss a coin but there's, there's a 50-50 chance that I will actually just drop the coin and it will roll into the gutter and, and then, then I get no result at all. And that's what, that's what we use failure for. Uh, so, so yeah, first, first we decide whether I drop the coin and I, I might fail. If, if I succeed, then it's either heads or tails. So hopefully, hopefully that's, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so maybe the, the idea here with these, the, these pictures is uh, the tree you can view as, as corresponding roughly to the semantics. The, the program I've written up there is, is the kind of code you'd write. Um, and the job of an implementation of, of these abstract computations is to, to generate these trees, and then, and then a handler is, a, is something that, that interprets the tree. So, yeah, okay, effect handlers. So, these were introduced by Fechner and Plotkin. Um, and as I said, it's, a, it's an interpreter for, for an abstract computation. Uh, and when you're composing these things together, in fact, the, the, the return type will probably also be, a, will often also be a, um, an abstract computation, so you can chain a whole load of them together. And then finally, at the top level, you have whatever your top level effects are. Um, right, and the way that we actually specify the effect handler is by writing a fold over the tree, essentially. So the return fold here is just saying what you do when you get to the leaf. Uh, and the operation fold is specified um, what happens if you come across some operation. Uh, I guess people tend to find most confusing at first when you see this in this, in this configuration argument. So P is just the parameter to the operation, so if it was labeled as push or something, then it would be the state that you're, you're updating. So the configuration um, captures the rest of the tree, allowing you to define more interesting interpretations. Um, 
So in, in fact, it, it doesn't just capture the tree, it captures interpreting the rest of the tree using the same hand block. So the arguments you pass to the continuation correspond to the return value of your operation. So, and each, 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 each um, value you pass into K will give you a different subtree. So I'll, I'll give you another very simple example. Uh, again, the state. Instead of just returning a value, it also returns a list of all the, all the values for state you've ever had. Uh, and rather than just invoking the continuation, you won't get the state like you did here in the case of put. It actually reads off the list of, of states uh, and conjures on, on the, the, the new one. And then having defined these, these handlers, we can Um, and in the, the log state case, um, the state start log was true and then it becomes false. Um, so I've already said some of this. If we just have closed handlers like the ones I've, I've just shown you, they, they only specify They only allow us to have get and put operations. But to, to, to get the, the nice modularity, we actually want to have open handlers, which will also deal with, with other operations and forward them. Um, OK, so now I'm, I'm about to go on to the, the demo bit. I'll just say a little bit about links. Um, yeah, so links is a a programming language for the web that I worked on years ago with, with Phil, um, Phil Wadler. Uh, the, the main idea is you write your code in one language and it gets translated into the, the different targets automatically. So rather than having to write JavaScript and Java or whatever and SQL and then having this impedance mismatch, you just write it in all in this one language which I guess you could say is, it, I mean, it's a strict statically typed language along the lines of, of ML. Um, so far, we've, we've not, um, we've not pushed effect handlers through the whole of the links implementation. I just had a, a, a master's student who, who experimented with, with adding, adding effect handlers. So he's only added it to the, the kind of server side. So the web side of things is kind of irrelevant for what we've done so far, although there might be some interesting things we could do. Um, but yeah, some relevant features. It's called by value, has type inference. It has first class continuations, which is helpful for being able to implement this, this general 
and the construction, which you can, is fairly evidently manipulating continuations in an interesting way. Uh, and in particular, it has row types, which are used for, for records and variants. Um, oh, yeah, we have a session typing extension that also uses the row types. Um, and it already has an effect system. Uh, so it, it made sense to, to, um, to see, see what things would look like if we could leverage this existing row type system to um, do effect handlers. Uh, and that's, this is what, what uh, my student Daniel has, has done. Uh, so, now I'm going to see what happens. So here's, is that, that's probably not big enough, is it? Is, that, is this readable by people at the back? One more. One more? Yeah, that's good. Is that good? Okay, good. Um, oh, and I guess I should, I need to give you some, some, some basic, a basic rundown of, of, of link syntax and the way things work for a start. Uh, so links has enary functions. Um, Oh, I need to make this one bigger as well. And so if I write something like that, this, this defines a function f that, that takes two arguments. Uh, and it's, it's kind of, the syntax is kind of modeled on JavaScript to some extent, because Phil thought that was a good idea at the time. Uh, and he also liked having, well, he thought it was important to have parentheses. He didn't, didn't want to have the spaces because he finds students apparently get confused by um, having function application without parentheses. But as a side effect, if we want to do a, a one argument function that takes a tuple, then you put lots of parentheses in. Um, now, what should I... I guess that's the basic thing with functions. Um, I could show you, yeah, just. This will illustrate some funny things going on with the row typing. So there's a, this is a function that just projects the label L from a record. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the, the, the disadvantage of doing this is that we have various extra features that Uh, so this will operate on any record that has an L label. Um, I think I'll no, sorry. I'll I'll go through some examples and mention features as they come up then. So the way we kind of do an operation is with this special do construct. Uh, but in practice, it tends to be more useful to kind of wrap these in, in help functions. So I've, I've done that. So these get and put things correspond to just doing get and put in an abstract computation. And then here's this, this bit toggling example. Uh, this is pretty stupid syntax, but var means let. Um, and then these are the, the examples you saw. And they're pretty much the same. Um, okay. And I can show you that in, oh, I need to load the thing personally. 
The first one does give you true, and the second one does give you true paired up with this, this list. Okay. So that's a fairly sort of boring initial example. Now I'll do something more interesting with the, the drunken coin tossing example. Um, First, I'm defining an empty type, which is just, I'm just doing as an empty, yeah, you go. Um, so I'm confused, this looks like much like delimited continuations. It is, exactly, delimited continuations, done right. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, so Andre Bauer likes to say that um, effect handlers are to delimited continuations as while is to go to. They give you a way of sort of constraining your delimited continuations. Um, okay. Right, and then, yeah, here's... This is the, the type that we define for our abstract computations. We call by value, so we, we represent them as thunks. Uh, uh, does that show up? Yeah. So we already have some effect typing going on in links, and that's used for something completely different. That's used for uh, distinguishing between code that can run on the database and code that can't. Uh, so in particular, um, any sort of, any general recursion or something, we're assuming can't run on the database. So there's only fairly restricted functions that can. And the squiggly arrow, that's a tilde, indicates that this is programming language code. We're not gonna run handlers on the so, so the effect is actually called wild. Um, it can't be run on the database. The E there is just an effect variable, and this kind annotation here is saying it's a row rather than an actual type. So it's a, a, a collection of, of effects. So an abstract computation, it takes the effect and the return type. Fine. Then we can define an abstract computation over our choice and, and failure operations. Um, so the row is denoted by the braces there. Uh, again, I've defined some helper functions. Uh, choice for this choice operation. Uh, choose allows us to turn that into a choice of two values. So heads or tails, I'll use that for. And then uh, oh yeah, as fail is returning zero, it, it can be more useful to actually turn that into a polymorphic thing that, just like raising an exception, you don't normally want to actually return zero. So this switch is a, is a case, basically, uh, and if we have an empty set of cases, then we can assign a polymorphic type to it. Okay, so I define a data type of tosses, and then here's the drunk toss example. Remember, I... I first of all, we'll decide whether the coin lands or not, and then I choose between heads and tails. Um, and we can repeat that several times. Okay, so the, the, right, the, the, the first handle I'm going to give for, for this is just a, another closed handler. So you see that the row is empty there. It only has choice and failure. It has no, it's not allowed any other effects. Oh, and I need to mention this. Yeah, so, so this, this arrow here to, to decrypt it, the squiggly bit means it's wild. Uh, and the other bit means that it's, um, it doesn't have any other effects. Um, so what do we do? In the case of, when we get to the return, oh, I should say what, what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to, what this is going to do is it's going to, it's going to return all of the possible paths through the tree in the list. So if we get to a leaf, what we do, we just return a signal to the list. Uh, failure, we return that to the list. Choice is the interesting case. Oh, I should also point out uh, when I 
previously gave the, the, the kind of like definition of the you know, parameter and the continuation. In, in the linked implementation, it, it takes n parameters. So in, in, in these cases, there are zero parameters followed by the continuation. Uh, but yeah, in the case of choice, we, we first find a true branch and then false branch. Um, yeah, so, whoops. If I load that in, then I should be able to run this handler on, let's see. So if I do if I do drunk tosses of three, it just gives me all the possible combinations. Okay. Um, now another possible interpretation we might want to give, unless I'm going to first of all do just as a boring uh, monolithic thing, um, is let's interpret the choice by randomly choosing one side or the other. And if we fail, we'll return nothing, and, and we lift everything. In to an option type. So for me, we do just. Um, so you can do that, but what's more interesting is if we can build these up, this up from components. So this is where open handlers come in. And in links, you just write open before your, your handle thing. explain some of the typing here as well. But, but the idea of this, this open handler is it's going to it only deal with the failure. You don't have to worry about any of the other concerns. You can get just nothing, just like that there, without the choice. The typing. Um, so it takes an abstract computation that has the failure, that can have the failure effect and some other things. Uh, and we want the other things to appear in the output, and they do. But the way that the, the, the type system works, for this type to be, this row type to be well formed, you, if, if you have E here and failure was mentioned up here, then you have to say something about what happens to the failure effect, because the E only ranges over things that aren't labeled failure. Uh, and what this, these braces denote that it's polymorphic in whether or not the failure effect occurs. So this could be used in a context where, where we have more failure. And it could be at any type, that failure. It wouldn't necessarily have to be a failure operation at the zero type. OK. Um, now we might also want to abstract. Yeah, up, up here I used the built-in random number generator that, that Lynx has, which generates a number between zero and, and one. Uh, but we, we could abstract over the algorithm by having another operation that we'll call RAND. Um, and then we, can, then we can give the interpretation I gave before, basically, uh, just for the, the RAND operation. Um, and something else happens with the typing, which is slightly irritating. So because, um, I mean, it's, for, it's essentially for the same reason, though. Because th this handler is, is actually, it's, it's, this is taking choice and, and interpreting it as, as a random choice. Um, but it's outputting this, this random um, operation down here, which is abstract. Um, and because it appears down here, it also has to appear up here. Because again, the E down here um, can only range over things that aren't mention mentioned to the left of the, the bar. So we do have a choice. We can't be polymorphic in whether the RAND operation occurs up here because it wouldn't make sense to say have rand of 
type int or something up here, because then that could get forwarded because it isn't explicitly handled here. And then you'd end up with this rand operation at different types in your, in your output, which, so the, the choice is you could either say, well, rand isn't allowed to occur in the input, or it has to occur at the same type. So you could have a, a slightly richer row type system that would be able to say, well, it, it may or may not be here, but if it is here, it has to have this type, but, but that's not what we currently have. Uh, another possible interpretation we can give is, uh, so this is for, for failure, Rather than um, just returning nothing, we can actually recursively call the same function if we fail. And just keep trying from the beginning of the, of the whole computation over and over again until we don't get a failure, which obviously calls problems if, if, there's, if there's no, no path to relief. It, it may not terminate. Um, Okay, and then, then you can define a, a closed handler for, for actually handling this, this RAND operation. Or you could do it and do all kinds of other, other interpretations. Uh, and then having defined these things, we can compose them together in, in different ways. Uh, so here, I, uh, yeah, sample maybe is... Um, so it's first interpreting choice as, as rand, and then it's interpreting um, failure as maybe, and then actually doing the, gen the actual ran random number generation at the end. And it turns out in this instance, you can swap these two round and you'll, the, and you'll get the same behavior. But that's, that's not always the case. And, and you can choose, you get to choose whichever way, well, it depends on the semantics you want. Um, and then similarly, we could do the same thing, but with persevere. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if I, do something like, <coughs> sample maybe drunk tosses, mm -hmm. it gives me nothing. <laughs> Oh, have I done something wrong? Oh. <laughs> I, was, I was very drunk on that particular run, and yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's, a, that's the basic idea of how you, how you can compose these things. Um, okay. Just wondering which one to go on to next. I guess I've got a choice of various things. No, actually, I'll show you. I, I know what I'll show you next. So this is another fairly simple example. Exceptions. So you mentioned delimited continuations. These things are a way of doing delimited continuations. Uh, but a degenerate case of, of handlers is exception handlers. If you don't use the continuation in a handler, then you have an ex exception handler, essentially. So, oh, and I'm using some syntactic sugar here that I haven't introduced yet. So maybe I will. But yeah, let's, let's say we have a, a division operation, an abstract operation. So it takes two integers and it gives you back an integer. Uh, and we'll have a raise, an exception operation, and we, we kind of wrap that in this raise function. Um, and it can take whatever payload you like. Then I can define, okay, right, yeah, so the, the first hand line defining mention the syntax of sugar first, be it rather than writing open handle, or rather than writing fun uh, divide handler open handle, I've just written open handler, which is just the syntax of sugar for the same thing. So it wraps a function around the handler and gives it a name. Uh, this is just interpreting division in the normal way. 
this check zero handler is a handler that uh, when it gets a division, it will it will raise to divide by, by zero. Um, Anything you type in capital letters is a valid variant value. <laughs> Minx doesn't have any nominal typing at all. It's entirely structural. Uh, so I can just make up that name. Uh, so if, if we do get a zero, then it raises the back by zero. If we don't, then uh, it re invokes the operation, which basically just forwards it so it can be handled again. And then here's the actual exception handler. Uh, Andrew Kennedy's not in the room. Oh, yeah. This is the point you look at. <laughs> so, uh, exceptional syntax. Uh, Andrew and Nick came up with this generalized syntax for, for exceptions. Uh, and this is essentially it. Zero, it's, it's, it's reporting divide by zero. And, and the, the distinguishing feature is that we're not doing the continuation, we're just throwing it away. And then, okay, we can wrap these things up. So composing together the, the check for zero, the divide handler, and the divide by zero handler, you get a checked version of division. Um, or we can just have an unchecked version of division. And if I run this on my... Uh. Whoops. Yeah, this isn't entirely... There's a stupid bug where if you, if you try to load a file that doesn't exist, it quits the whole thing. Oh, that's not very good. And I've also broken something else. Um, this was working, I'm sure it was working when I was, anyway, I guess, I guess this is the rule of demos is that something has to go wrong at some point. Uh, but yeah, can I fix the typo? I have a feeling that that is not helpful. Right. I'd, I'd not... The type signature was only allowing me to use the div operation and not any of the other operations. Um... So what were the examples? So test one was to was doing the unchecked version, and yes, it, oh yeah, that's coming from a another curious design decision of links was that the integers are actually represented as unbounded rationals, which is I think an accident that we should probably change at some point. Um, and that's, that's, yeah, that's basically saying divide by zero. It's the internal, uh, an internal OCaml, I think. Whereas if I do the checked version, then as, as you'd expect, I get that the, uh, the exception handler catches it. Okay. Uh, right, I've got some more interesting examples. Um, 
I'm maybe going to I'm going to ask the audience to decide which one I'm going to do. So there's either one that that implements this uh, the mathematical game of NIM, which is a very simple game where where two players take it in turns to take sticks from a pile, and the one who takes the last stick wins, and you're allowed to take between one and three sticks. Uh, and I have lots of different interpretations of that. Or um, I can show you aspect-oriented programming, uh, which is based on a paper by William Cook and Tom Shrivers and Bruno Oliveira. Um, any, or I can show you some more slides and some, some Greek and some typing rules. Uh, does anyone have any, any preferences for any of these things? No. Nim. Ah, right, good. Good choice. Ah. <coughs> so if I go through the whole of this, then I, it'll take me to the end of my slot. Uh, but. I don't know. I'll see. I'll see how it, how how we go. Is is this too small? Is that? Can you see that at the back? Good. Okay. So yeah, we we have this game. We've got players, Alice and Bob. Um, and I'm going to define a move operation. A player can. It, it takes the the player, and the number of sticks the player takes, and it return. Sorry, the number of. It takes the player and the number of sticks remaining, and it gives and the player decides um, how many sticks they want to take. Is the idea. So, a game uh, to, to start a game, we just pass in the number of sticks, uh, and then we have these these two mutually recursive functions corresponding to Alice and Bob making a turn. If if we run out of sticks, then, then and it's Alice's turn, then Bob wins. Otherwise, um, Alice makes a move, uh, choosing how many sticks to, to remove from the n remaining, and we subtract that from n and, and go to Bob's turn, and Bob's just the same, or just symmetric. So the first kind of in interpretation you can give is um, we can investigate different strategies that the players might, might take. So I'm defining a fairly generic uh, handler that's going to represent a strategy for a player. Uh, so you pass in the name of the player and the strategy S. And S is going to, the information S has available to it is the number of sticks remaining and the continuation, which I'm going to use in, in one of the, the strategies. Normally, you only need the number of sticks. But, um, uh, and this is only going to apply that strategy to that player. So it checks to see if the player matches up. Uh, and if it, if it does, then it applies the strategy. Otherwise, it just forwards the move through again. And then, and then you can uh, interpret the other strategy using a different handler, which you compose. So we can define a naive strategy that, that, say, always picks up one stick. Uh, the perfect strategy that takes the maximum of one and mod n4. It's fairly easy to see that that works out. And then uh, if we want to do, do a game between Alice and Bob, in which they both do the naive strategy, we just compose these two handlers together. Um, and then similarly, you can do uh, perfect strategies. And that's. Hopefully, this one will load. Yep. 
what were they called then? So we might do the naive strategy, I don't know, with 26. Oh dear. What have I done wrong there? Maybe I've, I've, I'm, I'm going, getting ahead of myself. Or maybe refactoring this code at the last minute was a bad idea. Was that a dynamic or static error? That was a dynamic error. Uh, because it's not, you could perfectly well enforce the invariant that, that um, at the top level you're not allowed any effects, but it isn't doing that. So if there are any unhandled effects that you just try and do, then it, then it fails dynamically. So that's, that's an, an exception. Um, I won't try to debug that just now. I do have a different version that works, but it's done in a more boring way. Um, but that doesn't, that, uh, yeah, okay. So the, the, the principle is, is okay, even though I have a bug somewhere. So I'll, I'll continue to explain how you compose these things, and then maybe I'll show you the version that works. Um, okay, so another strategy you might define will be one that does a brute force exploration, and that's where you actually need the And then, uh, then if there's if there's a winning strategy, then then they they pick that number. So it's obviously, I'm just going to turn out to be exactly the same as the perfect strategy, but much less efficient. Anyway, the, the point is, you, sorry. That's unfair, isn't it? What? Given that the player using that strategy knows what the other player is doing, because that's in the case. No, no, no. The, 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 this is just, just corresponds to knowing how the game works. It's not actually supposed to represent the player actually doing that. But if I call K and observe the result, and I know what the other player is, I'm not. No, 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 no. Oh, no, no. No, that's not what's happening. They're, they're exploring all the, all the possible moves. It's exploring the entire game tree. <laughs> And seeing if there's there's a winning strategy, and if there is, then 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 you pick that. Anyway, the details of that is not important for the the, the, the message of the composition message that I wanted to get across here, <laughs> even if it's wrong. So actually, I'm going to sort of s skip over some of this. I mean, I'm going to go over this quite quickly, but just I want to get the the point across, and then I'll come back to to sort of summarising. Um, so, yeah, a, another kind of thing you can do that's more interesting than just having a strategy is you can um, build up a game tree. So that's what this handler here is doing. So that, that actually, oh yeah, I at least have some output from running this a previous time. <laughs> so, so this is... This is um, tree and generating that tree. Uh, then you can do something like you can, you can pit a, a, a perfect strategy against, you can generate a tree that corresponds to Bob <coughs> playing a, a perfect strategy by doing a different kind of handler. You can, yeah, that's what that was going to do. Um, another thing we can do is, is uh, The, the, the abstraction we had so far didn't prevent people from cheating. So you could just have a, a cheating strategy where you just take all of the sticks. 
<laughs> and then you, you win. Um, um, but then we can, we can actually have a, a, a checking handler that, that checks for cheating. So if you wrap that around your game, then, then you, can, you can prevent cheating. Um, and then having done that, you can generate a, a cheat operation and you can handle that um, in, in however you like. So, so one option would be to um, end the game and say, so-and-so cheated, I'm not playing anymore. Uh, or you can say that the, the player that cheated loses. Um, so yeah, the, the, the point, although, although my, my example didn't run, <laughs> Uh, is, is that you can, yeah, you can put all these different interpretations together and you can compose them and it all works out quite nicely. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go back to my slides and that's doing something funny. Ah! There we go. Okay, so I had, we have a whole formalism for, for effect handles that I'm not gonna talk about, really. Uh, these were the typing rules for handlers. Um, and extensions for doing open handlers and row handlers. There's an, another kind of handlers that are useful. Um, I haven't shown you the first table, I'm not going to have too much detail of what's going on here. But the, the key idea is that rather than it being a fold, it becomes a case switch. So the continuation of the event doesn't give you, doesn't interpret it, the rest of the continuation of the handle, it just gives you the truth, essentially. Um, and that means you get no recursion built into the semantics of, of the handler, but it, it makes things more flexible. Uh, it essentially allows you to kind of reflect on the entire computation at every step, uh, which is very useful for writing certain kinds of examples, and it's, it's much closer to the kinds of things that people do with free monads, for instance, in, in Haskell. Um, and it's harder to implement efficiently. Uh, how am I for time? Two minutes. Another thing I've, I've been working on for a while with Connor McBride, uh, and I have an intern who's just started implementing, is, is this language called Frank, which sort of takes handlers as, as primitive, and it takes them very seriously indeed. Um, it, it uses shallow handlers, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide. Uh, but Everything is a handler, so, I mean, if you think about it, if you just had a handler that only has a return clause, that pretty much the same thing as a function. So in Frank, that's, that's really what happens, and, and you actually have um, mul multi-argument handlers, we call multi-handlers, and you end up with a, 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 an evaluation scheme that's not really called by value, it's sort of called by handling, or is it the arguments to your the things you pass in are, are abstract computations. Uh, and you, you can actually look at all of them at once in deciding what to do next. And that's, that gives you very nice implementations of things like um, pipes. Uh, it also has a, a, a cool kind of effect polymorphism where you never have to mention any type variables anywhere. But anyway, that's, that's that. Uh, some related, lots of related things. Transformers, free words, et cetera, the delimited continuation thing that you brought up. Um, and yeah, so d the, the, the standard deep handles I was presenting correspond to particular control operators, shift zero and reset zero. Shallow handles correspond to control zero and prompt zero. I think there's also other relationships with various other abstractions that I'd like to explore. Uh, and there's all of the related work. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I think I was kind of arguing to, uh, to some sense of the advantage 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 of the
do have a static guarantee that it will all be defined, except in the, the implementation at the top level where I wasn't trying to enforce that. But, but the type system does guarantee everything will be defined. That's, that's part of the point. Um, so is the similarity like, what's the advantage? Yeah, what's the advantage? So you get different answers from different people. If you ask the people who did a lot of the, the sort of foundational work on this, it, they have, there's a really nice semantics for handlers. That people, there are lots of other modularity techniques that people have and all the, the clever stuff that you can implement in Haskell. But say if you're using type classes or polymorphism and so on, you don't have any sort of nice, clean, simple denotational semantics. This, is, this has a very clean, basic story. Um, but that's, yeah, that's, from the point of view of Programming, uh, so I mean, I don't know, what, what, what do you want to compare with? If you want to compare with monotransforms, uh, the, a key advantage um, is, with, with monotransformers you end up having to insert lists in various places, and you have this sort of implicit ordering, and, and there are tricks to get around that, but uh, you don't have that problem with, with handlers. There's, there's no... Um, Although I think that the, 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 the key feature, I mean, you can perfectly well implement handlers in Haskell, and people have, uh, because they're useful. There's this extensible effects library of Olegs, for instance. Um, but a key feature that you, you want to make the story cleaner is, is some kind of unordered type level things. Um, there shouldn't be an order on the effects. But the, 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 yeah, I mean, compositionality is, is, is what it's good for. You, you get to define how you handle your little bits of effects separately in a way that, that composes more cleanly than, than monad transformers, for instance. Um, but it, I mean, in a sense, it is a form of you, you could view it as a form of modules, I suppose. It's sort of effectful modules. More questions? I have one. Um, so you, you showed, showed this uh, image in the uh, link, uh, mm -hmm. the examples, right? Was that, uh, Uh, we, we don't really know. The, the, the reason for doing it was I... So that the thing I mentioned about um, the ordering of effects... I mean, it sort of it um, lends itself to, to uh, the, the, implement it. The, re the reason we did, the, the, did it was because we happened to have this row type system lying around and it seemed like a natural way to, to implement this. So, uh, yeah. You don't know what that But uh, we, I haven't really thought about whether it's actually... Uh, I mean, that would be... And, and it'd be interesting to try and implement. We we, we haven't. There's a Lynx has a compiler to JavaScript. Right. It'd be interesting to, to investigate that. There's also, I mean, there's some interesting questions about how you implement this efficiently, um, and, and that I haven't gone into 